garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of a contradictory force. Our of force is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people, with one will, one resolve, one cause. Our enemies shall talk themselves to death. January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Disruption. That's the theme today. That's the theme of that commercial. And Steve Jobs was a master at disruption. That Macintosh you saw was the first thing, first computer you could really bring home in a box, plug into your wall. It starts the home computer revolution. Steve also is a disruptor of many other industries. The way we listen to music, disrupted by the iPod. The way we could buy music, albums, no, disrupted by iTunes. The phone turns us into a mobile computing society as does the iPad, and the iPad, of course, disrupts my old industry, the industry of publishing, especially those of us who can remember the joys of publishing a weekly magazine on paper, something that was so 20th century, or 15th century, if you want to go back to Gutenberg. But disruption is obviously nothing new. You know, uh, back uh, the great disruption of the Industrial Revolution came when they created looms that used punch cards and sometimes even steam to replace the weavers who are making beautiful patterns. Lord Byron was a Luddite. By that I mean he actually was a Luddite. He supported Ned Ludd, the f people who were smashing the looms, the followers of Ned Ludd in the Midlands of England. Uh, his only speech in the House of Lords said, that this type of disruption would put people out of work, would destroy people's livelihoods, and that's what the loom owners were doing. In fact, throughout history, starting with the Industrial Revolution, something magical has always happened, which is that disruption and technology has led to more opportunities, more productivity, and even more jobs. Uh, this is something that Lord Byron's daughter, Ada Lovelace understood quite well. Ada Lovelace uh, was the only child of Lord, only legitimate child of Lord Byron. <laughs> she traveled the Midlands and loved the way those looms were using punch cards to do something beautiful. And that, to me, is the first lesson of disruption and what we do in any field, whether it's services or products or nonprofits or NGOs, whatever we're doing. It's to connect the idea of the humanities to technology, to connect the arts to the sciences. When Ada Byron Lovelace, or Ada Byron, the Countess of Lovelace, saw those punch cards and how they instructed the looms to uh, weave beautiful patterns, she thought of a machine that a friend of hers was building, a guy named Charles Babbage, who was creating what was called the analytical engine. It was a machine that was supposed to calculate uh, equations. It was a numerical calculator, but very complicated, and it worked by putting in punch cards. And she made the connection that if those punch cards could do something beautiful, like weave patterns, the punch cards in the analytical engine could do more than process numbers. They could process anything that was notated in symbolic form. In other words, they could make patterns, they could make music, as she said, they could make art, they could process words. In other words, she came up with the concept of the modern day computer. That was her great contribution of connecting the arts to the sciences. That was Steve Jobs' genius as well, a belief that beauty mattered. He said, when I first started working with him on a biography, he said, that he loved being a humanities kid when he was a growing up. He loved reading poetry, doing calligraphy. But 
he also was fascinated by electronics. And then he read something that Edwin Land, the creator of Polaroid, wrote, which was that those who can stand at the intersection of the arts and the sciences will be the disruptors, will be the innovators, will be the most creative. And Steve said, that's where I always wanted to stand. And so that's where you get to that ad. However, lesson number two here is that disruption and innovation is not a loner's pursuit. Innovation, and this is something I've been studying and writing about for my next book, innovation comes from collaboration most often. This is something that we biographers sometimes get wrong. If you ever Google or go on Amazon to search the man who invented, you know, in Google you get about 8,600 books, the man who invented this or that and the other. But no, innovation and invention is not generally done in a garret or garage with a light bulb moment coming out. It's done by people getting together and collaborating. And that's what this action forum is all about, is creating a notion of connections, of networks, of somebody like Jordan Caslow who does eyeglasses and then does it you know, in Africa, and somebody else who knows how to do a startup business, and people sitting around saying, yeah, I'm working on education too, but maybe that would connect to what you do. And that gets you to the third lesson, which is collaboration happens better face-to-face -face and in person. One of the things we thought of the digital revolution was that we'd all Skype or, you know, friend each other on Facebook or network virtually or use the web or somehow or another uh, be able to network in a virtual world. One of the things that I've learned at the Aspen Institute is that people who do network in the virtual world, what they really love is the ability then to come face to face and in person. Steve Jobs understood that as well. When Steve Jobs was building Pixar headquarters 15 years ago, he built one big atrium, and to get to the bathroom, everybody had to walk through the atrium. To get to the cafeteria, to get to the screening rooms, everything fed in, because he said that serendipitous encounters face-to-face, -face, where you weren't expecting something, you just sort of said, hey, what, your, what are you working on? That's the way real creativity was sparked. We see that over and over again. Bell Labs was the great font of disruptive innovation back before it got disrupted. Bell Labs creates everything from the transistor to the laser to all the fundamentals of the digital age. They did so because they built this wonderful campus in Murray Hill where there were long corridors and information theorists like Claude Shannon who would juggle balls on a unicycle up and down the corridors. These theorists would meet with theoretical physicists or quantum mechanics, but also people with grease under the fingernails because they were pole climbers for the Bell System or the business people at the Bell System or the material scientists. And they put them all together in a cluster and they said, okay, how are you going to create in silicon? How are you going to dope the silicon to make it a semiconductor? And it was a team of people that did it together and did it in a place-based operation. So to me, collaboration happens in places, and that is why Peter and everybody else here have created this, the Action Forum, where we actually can get together and do it in person. One other lesson is that um, innovation, uh, ideas, innovation, without execution is just a hallucination. Vision without, hallucin without execution is just a hallucination. We have to turn thoughts into action. This is another mantra of what Peter and others have invented here, turning thought into action. Because there is nothing worse than going to a conference or being you know, at Fortune Brainstorm as we had last week and people showing you PowerPoints or presentations of some great innovation or idea they had, but they haven't been able to turn it into action. If you look at the great disruptions of the digital age, it wasn't just visionaries like Steve Jobs, but it was people who knew how to turn it into action, to execute it, like Steve Wozniak, that you had to pair. And that's why it's a collaborative endeavor. You need to pair the visionaries with the people who can act, the people who can focus on things and uh, make it work. 
And the final lesson is that man, or humans, man is a social animal. This is not new. This is, those of you who have taken the Aspen Seminar will know, this is Aristotle's great bit of wisdom. But as William Gibson said in Burning Chrome, the great cyberpunk story, the street finds its own uses for things. So every time we've had a new technology, somehow or another, it's been co-opted and brought together so that it becomes a social network, a way of communicating, a way of getting people together. And that, too, is what this is all about. Getting people together so you're not in your garage, in your garret, trying to invent something, but you're making the connections that make us all stronger. So that is why we have made our pledges here. That's what we're all doing here. And that's why it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the what annual? Second, third? Second annual uh, Action Forum. Thank you all for being here. Now, uh, throughout the Action Forum, uh, we've asked uh, particular participants to uh, share those action pledges that we did last year. I think I'm sharing mine in a couple of days, because mine was about a service year project, and I promise you a report on that. But now, we're going to introduce a few other people who can introduce themselves, but tell you what they've done with their action pledge. Thank you. My name is Jason Atkinson. I am in the inaugural Rodell class, and my pledge was to finish the largest conservation project in American history, which is the simultaneous removal of four dams in two states that is blocked by 100 years of racism and the very worst in American politics. I was at a Guatemala Good Life seminar with Keith Berwick, my sister Pauline, my brother Marshall, Anne, Casey, uh, Patricia, Mary, what people who I love, and I decided I would do it right there. I would put my entire career on hold and get this done because the window is 2015. The project starts by a world-class film that is nationally distributed, that hopefully changes culture, that does not ask Congress to lead. In fact, it just makes it easy for Congress to do the right thing and get to the White House with an executive order that finishes the largest conservation project in history. We were workshopped here. Last year, many of you contributed your mind, your heart, your talent, and Friday I will show you the film. Uh, the politics are lining up. There's only two more big dots to complete, and we're right there. If you heal people, they will heal a river. I'm Manoj Kumar from the India Leadership Initiative. I'm also the CEO of Nandi Foundation, a nonprofit in India. My action pledge was to work to support the education of 100,000 girls. And I'm happy to say that this involved getting the money for that and to put them through school, including uh, their uniforms and their tutorials separately outside schools. And um, the second part was easy because that's what I do normally. The first was challenging to raise money and the strategy that I had to do was to move from raising retail donations to go to large businesses in India and convince them of this action pledge that I have to meet the deadline in a year's time. And last week, I crossed the 100,000 mark. Thank hey. you. My name is Carla Mata. I am a Cali Fellow from Guatemala and a businesswoman in the logistics and transportation sector. My action pledge was to empower girls and protect them from violence. And in the last 12 months, I have brought together an international team of creative artists and amazing volunteers in Guatemala. We produced and launched in Guatemala and in the, in the United States a multimedia campaign to raise funds for La Alianza Shelter and make awareness of the issue on sexual abuse. Through the power of communication and creativity, we awaken different sectors. We are now talking about the issue and demanding a change in our culture, our laws, and more importantly, 
on our indifference to protect the most vulnerable citizens. Hi, my name is Stephen DeBerry. Um, I'm a Henry Crown Fellow and the Founder and Chief Investment Officer at Bronze Investments. Uh, my action pledge was to move $50 million toward the benefit of low-income um, people. Uh, and uh, since I made that pledge, my firm has made several investments. I'll, I'll share just a couple of them with you. Uh, one is uh, a university that we built from scratch called University Now. Um, uh, I'm glad to say that university uh, is now fully accredited and functioning. You could look it up probably on your phone right now at younow.com. It's um, uh, accredited by the same folks that accredit Stanford, Berkeley, so high quality degree, um, but the tuition is less than uh, $5,000. Um, a second investment is a company called LendUp, which is an alternative to payday lending. Um, it reduces interest rates from more than 1,000% down to 29% and ultimately putting uh, its borrowers into traditional bank accounts. That company has gone on to raise uh, follow-on investment from Google Ventures and others uh, and raised $50 million uh, to lend uh, early, uh, about two months ago. And this month has expanded into uh, to the third state just for this month, now in 10 plus states in the US. My name is Peter Riley. I am a Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute. In 2013, my action pledge was to work with my fellow fellow and fellow moderator, Watanan Petersik, to launch a Southeast Asia leadership initiative. Since then, I've traveled to Singapore and to Jakarta to help Watanan to identify potential partners and funders. And in November of this year, Watanan, myself, Skip Battle, will run a pilot leadership seminar in Phuket designed to create a core group of supporters for a fellowship program which we hope will launch in late 2015. Hey. Welcome everybody. I have the honor uh, to follow Walter here in welcoming you to the second annual Aspen Action Forum. Welcome. It is so good to have you all here. I have no fingernails left after looking at the clouds yesterday and wondering if any airplane was going to land in Aspen. Uh, but thank goodness you were all here, and thank you so much for making what for many of you is 30, 40 hour voyages. So welcome to Aspen. We have the Archbishop uh, here from South Africa. He has a few phone calls in. We should be seeing the sun within the next <laughs> few days. Each year at the Aspen Institute at the uh, end of June and the beginning of July, um, we have our longtime anchor event that some of you have attended. It's called the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, for those of you who've had the opportunity to be here, you know it's an incredible opportunity to absorb some of the most, uh, the newest, the most innovative, uh, the most important trends in the world and in the United States. And in fact, Kitty Boone, I think you're somewhere in the room. Are you here somewhere? I saw you earlier, but Kitty Boone is the person who puts together that amazing event and I want to make sure that uh, there she is, all the way in the back. <laughs> Seated right next to my colleague, Executive Vice President Elliot Gerson in the back of the room. Two and a half years ago, after I think eight years, if I'm not mistaken, or seven years of the Aspen Ideas Festival, I got a call from uh, Walter. He was in Mexico. Uh, and as I said last year, whenever I get a call from Walter, I get a little nervous because I knew there's a new idea coming. Because he does sit alone in his garage and come up in his garret and come up with new ideas. Oh, I was <laughs> Excellent. And so uh, he called me up and he said, you know what, we need a second anchor event for the summer here in Aspen. And why don't we build one that will be every year at the end of July? And why don't we call it the Aspen Action Forum? And that's really how this all came together. And this is what this event is about, action. Now, we know that everyone in this room is very, very active in your communities, in your cities, in your countries, in the region. Some of you are actually active on a global level. Our hope with this thing we call the Aspen Action Forum is to inspire each one of you, as busy as you are, to stretch yourselves even further and to commit yourself to an even higher level of activity. 
I think that's why a few people stay away from this event. They say, I'm stretched to breaking. And we say, that's fine. It's an annual event. Come next year once your elastic has come back together again. But ultimately, this is about stretching each, of one, of, each one of us. We certainly know how much the world needs it. All we have to do is pick up the newspapers, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Asia and Europe, Central America, Africa, or right here in the United States, we know that the world needs action. And that's why we're asking each of you attending this event to make an action pledge. We asked you to do it at the time of registration. Uh, some of you did. We set up our action walls, and yes, the uh, markers we have out there are waterproof. So we ask you to make an action pledge. Uh, you can do it on the wall. You can do it in what we call the hub, which is the tent we've set up in front of our uh, uh, fountain, our Roman garden fountain there in the middle of the uh, campus. You can even do it via Twitter if you want to do a hashtag my Aspen action. But we ask that everybody leave here having committed to a new action. It's what it's all about. Now, an event like this, if you just look around the room, it's big. Uh, we filled this room, and an event like this cannot be pulled together without the support and hard work of so many people. And very, first of all, I'm going to ask Linda to put down her iPhone for a minute, right? <laughs> just, and so she was, just, she was just tweeting her action pledge is what she was doing. But Linda and Stuart Resnick, I want to thank you for your underwriting of this Aspen action pledge. You're all going to have an opportunity to hear a wonderful interview tomorrow. Uh, Walter will be interviewing Stuart, and he's promised to uh, unveil all sorts of hidden secrets about his past and his family, but most importantly about his business and how he works in the world. And so we're very much looking forward to that. I'd like to thank uh, David Rubenstein, who will be with us as well tomorrow, another uh, great supporter of the Action Forum. Uh, without him, we would not have been able to launch our China Fellowship Program. I know we have several fellows here from China. I'll acknowledge you in a few moments and ask you to stand. Uh, and David's going to talk about, uh, again, and along this theme of disruption, Walter will be interviewing Stuart about disruption in business. Uh, David's going to talk about disruption in history. Those of you who know him know that in addition to his business life, he's an incredible scholar, uh, looking back at uh, all periods of history, but especially the founding period of the United States. And he'll be talking about disruption uh, in history. I want to thank our friends from the Skoll Foundation who are here, who are uh, joining us this year as partners in the Aspen Action Forum for what we hope will be a, a multi-year partnership. I want to thank our friends from Accenture as well, who are coming on this year as partners as well. And there's a wonderfully long list of uh, trustees and friends. I include uh, Margo and Tom Pritzker, Bob and Jillian Steele, Mike Klein and Joni Fabry, Ann McNulty, Bill Budinger, who I saw here, the guy with the hat is here, and so many others listed in this uh, often daunting program book, but an incredibly um, useful uh, book if you take a look at it. Thank you to all for making this possible for the second. The theme of this year's Action Forum is disruptive leadership. Depending where you sit, disruption can be a good thing or a bad thing. It can be a challenge or it can be an opportunity. The fact is that all of you in your leadership roles, whether you're in business or you're in government or you're in the nonprofit sector, whether you're in technology or finance or media, uh, or as many of you are if you're in education, all of you are either leading disruption or else you're responding to disruption. And this is a theme that we're going to be digging into for the next three days. Watching the news, of course, we're reminded daily of other disruptions of other kinds that are going on around the world as we sit here in Aspen. Many of our Aspen Leadership Fellows are in one way or another in the thick of current events in the Middle East. Uh, I'd like to make a special mention of one of our Middle East Leadership Fellows, Ola Awad, uh, who was shot uh, in the upper leg while marching alongside her 12-year-old son near Ramallah late last week. Uh, I got an email that you always hate to get saying a fellow has been shot, and it certainly stopped my heart to see that. The bullet hit her in the leg, and she's thankfully recovering. Uh, at least physically. Uh, but the sad fact is that we have fellows who mean the world to us who are on both sides of this conflict going on right now. It's nothing if not tragic. Our hope is that in some small way, the bonds of our fellowship will help to create bridges of 
empathy and bridges of dialogue across terrible divides that we see in the world right now. The Middle East has no monopoly on disruption today. Our news newspapers are full of powerful stories of children coming to the U.S. from Central America, often fleeing terrible conditions in their countries. We get news from northern Nigeria of young girls being kidnapped from their schools. We get news from Russia uh, and from the Ukraine, planes with hundreds of souls shot out of the sky. But we get news right here at home from places like Detroit, New Orleans, Chicago, my own hometown of Baltimore. Um, there's disruption everywhere. We're very proud of all of our fellows and others in the room today who are hard at work promoting peace, fighting extremism, battling poverty, guaranteeing access to pretty basic things like food, housing, education. John Dacey, where are you? Uh, pretty historic court case in California that John was very much involved in, many people in this room very much involved in guaranteeing education to, to everybody who has a right to it and to health care. We have people working to ensure a life, as you just heard in one of the action pledges, a life without violence, and violence that's not coming from, from rockets or tanks, but violence that's often within families uh, and in, in communities that we think are safe. Um, all of these people are working to lay the groundwork for what we hope will be a much more positive future. As Walter said, we need to be thinking collectively, and we're here to collectively to figure out what we can do how we can act to make an impact in this world, and not just an impact, but a positive impact. So who is in this room here today? This is one of the things I enjoy the most. I get the, the honor of opening this every year. And so you've had your lunch. It's going to be time for a little uh, aerobics in a few minutes. So here's what we know. We're about 320 people in the room today uh, from 31 countries around the world. Uh, half of us are men. Half of us are women. Most of the people in the room are from the private business sector, others are from government, others are from the nonprofit sector. But who exactly are we? Well, in the beginning, there was the Henry Crown Fellowship Program. This was made possible thanks to the, the vision and the generosity of Francis Hoffman and his wife, Muriel. Francis, would you mind standing for us? Yay. Francis and Muriel worked very closely with the former head of the Aspen Institute, David McLaughlin, but of course the fellowship was brought to life thanks to the tenacity and to no small measure of magical dust that he always talks about that was sprinkled on this by Keith Berwick, the father of us all. Keith? <laughs> Keith wisely worked closely on the program's design and the curriculum with Skip Battle, and I know I saw Skip Battle. Stand up, please, Skip Battle. <laughs> and someone who's not here with us today, um, which is remarkable because he's never missed one of these events. This is the second annual action form, but we then had three events before this we used to call Act Two, which we thought was a clever play on words, but nobody agreed with me. Um, <laughs> But, and that, Ben Dunlap is not with us, known as Bernie Dunlap in uh, South Carolina, but it really was uh, Keith and Skip and Ben who breathed life into this thing we call the Henry Crown Fellowship Program. And Ben, I hope maybe you're on live, live stream, know that you're very much missed uh, and we're very much thinking of you. All of this was done under the steady guidance of Bill Mayer as the hey. chairman of the Board of Overseers of the Henry Crown Fellowship Program. So as we do every year, let me ask that the, the fellows, the moderators, the managing director, and the board members of the Henry Crown Fellowship Program, please stand for a round of, round of applause. I'd like to give a special shout out to our new managing director of the Henry Crown Fellowship Program, Tonya Hinch. Tonya, where are you? Stand up, please. 
And I'd like to give another special shout out to our outgoing managing director, our poet laureate, Eric Motley. Where are you, Eric? There he is. <laughs> Of course, uh, the Henry Crown Fellowship Program has since been the seedbed of over a dozen other leadership initiatives that we created in its image. So that today, believe it or not, we're now nearly 2,000 fellows spread out across 48 countries in something that we call the Aspen Global Leadership Network today. I'm delighted that we have representatives of every single one of those leadership initiatives with us at this action forum. So let me ask that the fellows, the moderators, the managing executive directors, the board members, of each of the following initiatives, please stand. And I'm going to do it in the order in which they were created, going back to 2000, with the beginning uh, in Ghana, where so many things have begun, the Africa Leadership Initiative, West Africa. Could I ask you to stand, please? From West Africa, we moved to East Africa and created the Africa Leadership Initiative in East Africa. So could I ask those from East Africa to please stand? The West Africa Initiative covers Ghana and Nigeria. The East Africa Initiative covers Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda. So it's great to have you all here. I am delighted that we have so many members of the Africa Leadership Initiative Mozambique here, led by Romeo Rodriguez. Please stand. <laughs> and a healthy delegation from the Africa Leadership Initiative South Africa, led by Isaac Shongwe. Where are we, Isaac? The Liberty Fellowship of South Carolina, with great thanks to Hain and uh, Anna Kate Hip, who are here, uh, Jenny Johnson, and just announced within the last 24 hours, the new Associate Executive Director, Luann Rungi. Please stand. <laughs> always well represented and always good at raising the decibel level in any room that they enter as they did last night, the Central America Leadership Initiative. <laughs> Executive Director Saul is over here. Saul, please stand. Uh, the Rodell Fellowships in Public Leadership, with thanks to uh, Bill Budinger. The Nigeria Leadership Initiative, a separate program focused on Nigeria. Do we have anyone here? I think Yes, we do. Mariam, of course. The Pahara Aspen Education Fellowship, led by Kim Smith. You'll note in the program book that we have a special track focused on education, and this is very much driven by our Pahara fellows, uh, with great thanks to them. The uh, India Leadership Initiative. The Caddo Fellowship Program on, on Energy and the Environment. The Middle East Leadership Initiative. Yay. The Aspen Teacher Leaders Fellowship Program. And you thought Act Two was a bad name. Yeah. The <laughs> Aspen Teacher Leaders Fellows. Do we have any here? But Kim Smith, yes, of course we do. I'm joking about the name. And <laughs> la last but not least, the most recent of our fellowship programs, the China Leadership Initiative.
Who else are we here? Well, we have uh, 10 fellows, Resnick fellows from the Central Valley of California, and I'd like you all to please stand. We have Skoll Foundation social entrepreneurs here with, with us from around the world. Please stand. We have graduates of my favorite university in the world, even though I went to Georgetown, I went to Cal, where I, where I met my wife, but it is Ashesi University of Ghana. Some of you will remember that the winner of the uh, John P. McNulty Prize several years ago was Patrick Awua, a member of the Africa Leadership Initiative in West Africa. Patrick from Ghana created Ashesi University, and we thought it'd be a wonderful thing to have some of the graduates here today. So we're so delighted to have you here with us. Welcome. Who else are we here? Well, we have Echoing Green Fellows. We have Aspen Institute First Movers Fellows, Ascend Fellows. We have participants from the Aspen Institutes in Romania, in Spain, and France. We have members of the Aspen Institute Society of Fellows. We have members of the Society of Fellows Vanguard chapter. Let me ask you all, and anybody else I have a name, to please stand and, and welcome you. Now there's another really important contingent in the room today, and I know I'm double counting on some of these, but this is the Aspen Global Leadership Network Moderator Corps. At the essence, and everything we do at the Aspen Institute is the seminar. And without moderators who do the great work of in inspiring us and nudging us to greater heights, nothing would be possible. And so I'd like to ask the members of the Aspen Global Leadership Network Global Moderator Corps to please stand. A special shout out to, again to Keith Berwick, to Skip Battle, to Stace Lindsay, to David Langstaff, to Ben Bernie Dunlap, and to Watanan Petersik, who are our senior moderators. We, we take all over the world away from their families too much. I'm in that group as well. Denise will, will agree with me. But uh, it's such important work that you do. Thank you so much for the, all that you give to this. Margot Pritzker is here, right there. She's trying to hide behind that sign, but I do see her. Margot, please stand. She's the chairman of the Aspen Institute's Leadership Committee that oversees all of the work we're doing. And she and Bill Mayer are doing very important for work, work for us, helping us to build up our campaign to raise funds, uh, working closely with Amy Marjoram. I'm not sure if Amy is in the room, but uh, I wanted to thank you all for that, for that campaign. Thanks so much. Anne McNulty, I'm not sure if Anne is here yet. We'll be hearing from her tomorrow night. We'll be with her as we award, uh, as we announce this year's finalists for the McNulty Prize. Uh, and so we'll get time with her. And then I need to thank my team. Uh, there's an incredible team that's been working really since the day after the last action form finished, and I need to recognize them. And so I'd like to ask my team to stand. This is Abigail Golden Vasquez. This is Stace Lindsay. This is Caitlin Colgrove. This is Sydney Turnbull. This is Dancy Glover, Priya Fremerman, Martha Lang, uh, Janice Wilkins. I feel so bad because I didn't thank her last year, and I've had a, a year without sleep, and so this time I know I'm going to do it. And Josh Browder, please stand, and thank you so much for everything you've done. Did I forget someone? Uh, I think I might have forgotten someone, but I didn't forget someone. And that is really the master of the Aspen Action Forum, and that is Tom Loper. <laughs> there is, unfortunately, one member of our global family who is not with us today, and unfortunately this is something we seem to do at every one of our action forms, but I'd like to take a moment to remember Zandile Nyandu Sitole from the fifth class of the Africa Leadership Initiative in South Africa, and I'd like to ask for a moment of silence as we remember Zandile.
Thank you. We've designed the Action Forum this year to be super participatory. This is not an event where you can just come and sit and listen and soak up uh, things. Uh, our moderators are very good at knowing when you're trying to avoid eye contact. Um, this is a time to be, <laughs> you'll be active whether you want to be or not. And in fact, uh, we were looking at the numbers. As I said, we're about 320 people here. A full 180 of you have active roles as either moderators, lead discussants, panelists, workshop recipients, or more. And so just a few more aerobics, okay, before we get to dessert. If you are moderating one of our mini seminars, please stand up. If you're going to be moderating or serving as a discussant in one of our uh, interactive roundtables, as we call them, please stand up. If you've brought what we call an action workshop here so that you're going to get some advice on how to solve a problem that you're facing, please stand up. If you're going to be running a workshop for us, helping some of us in the room figure out how we might do things better, from measuring our success to communicating our message to crowdfunding our, our business opportunities or our projects, please stand up. If you're going to be serving on one of our public panels at one of our public events, please stand up. Excellent. So I've just run through the basic components of the agenda for the Action Forum. We have seminars. Those are readings based. I know you've all done your readings at least three times, as you always do. Uh, it is impossible to participate at a seminar at the Aspen Institute without doing your readings. Please do them. They're, we made them especially short for you. <laughs> then we have the action, the interactive roundtables. The, and the way this works is instead of a reading, we ask, we pick topics, we crowdsource the topics from across the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Some of them are personal, dealing with aging parents, as I know I am, uh, dealing with uh, troublesome children, as I know I'm not, um, dealing with, uh, I'm about to leave my job, and um, uh, how do I do that without stepping in it on the way out the door? Uh, I'm thinking of stepping into politics. How do I do that? Uh, I'm sitting in Africa and trying to figure out what is China doing in Africa. We have all sorts of great topics here. Some of them focused on the heart. Some of them focused on the head. Uh, and the way they work is we ask three people who actually know something about the topic at hand to speak for no more than five minutes each. And as Walter said, it's a PowerPoint-free zone. We don't use PowerPoints here uh, very often within the, uh, uh, the action form. But the idea then is that not that this become a panel discussion where everyone's just asking questions of those three people. In classic style, we then turn it into an Aspen-moderated discussion where each of you will be asked to speak to the topic at hand. And you wouldn't be there if you didn't have something to share or something that you wanted to learn. We'll have the action workshops. Um, these are, as I said, opportunities for people who are facing challenges in their projects, who would like some advice, some structured advice on their projects and how they might overcome hurdles. Uh, and those are uh, a great opportunity for people not just to receive advice, for, but for you to share what you've learned over the years. One important thing about all of these events that I want to share with you is this is meant to be a zone of confidentiality. If we do our job well, these seminars uh, will be very similar to the seminars that make up the, the core components of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. And we ask people to share freely and openly and in a zone of trust. So we ask that as people share, we treat that confidentially. If you come out with a great idea, it's great to talk about that great idea, but that we ask that we not attribute ideas to individual people. If we can do that, people will share openly, and that's really the essence of this event. So there's lots of other things going on, um, lots of fun. I don't want this to sound like homework. You've got to do your readings and so on. We're going to have speed dating. We have the hub out there. We have uh, an espresso bar. The wine will be certainly be flowing. We even have an oxygen bar. Um, however, we are in Colorado. There's certain, even though we're here, there's certain things. <laughs> Although I can see the China fellows laughing over there already because 
Joe, I see you. Um, but uh, even though we're in Colorado, certain things will not be on the campus, but it, this is going to be fun. We are going to have... We are going to have the world's best dance party on uh, Thursday evening up on top of the mountain. I hope you'll all come. It's uh, one of the best dance bands I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, some of the things may be tweaked from day to day. We ask you to look at the screens each morning to see what's changed in the agenda. Um, but otherwise, we hope that this is not just a, um, um, uh, an event that challenges you, but we hope it's an event that very much refreshes you and is fun. So we're going to begin now, right after lunch, um, with the first of our events, which is what we call the seminars. Seminars are, of course, the core of the Aspen experience. In them, we use readings to prompt a dialogue around particular leadership issues that we think are very important. And um, the seminars are really the, the core and the crown jewel, I think, of the Aspen Institute. So I want to use this opportunity to do just one more thing, if you'll bear with me. And this is to unveil, for the very first time, the first of what will be a series of what we are calling Aspen Institute Booster Shots. These are short, highly produced videos that we'll be sending out now on a monthly basis to all alumni of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. They're meant to be a reminder not just of the seminar experience that we'll all have been through by the end of this week, uh, but of the very difficult questions that these seminars ask each of us to ask ourselves in our daily leadership. This video series was filmed in the studios of Lucas Films uh, in San Francisco. Uh, it was conceived, financed, and created by the Henry Crown Fellowship class of 2009. And I'd like to ask the members of the 2009 class, because I think we have several here, to please stand. I think some people got caught up on uh, planes that are late, but we have Michelle Kidley who should be here, Tamson Smith I saw in the back of the room, Susie Hassan will be coming in shortly, Anita Antonucci, Prita Bansal, I know you're here, I saw you stand, Paul Gaffney of course is one of our moderators, Rebecca Blumenstein, um, they all did a great service to all of us. I'd also like to thank Chris Varelis. I know he stood up uh, to be acknowledged for help, our help with financing this, Josh Greer, Suzanne Nora Johnson, but let's roll with the inaugural video of the Aspen Booster Shot series. respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We understand life, right? We understand liberty. What's he talking about with regard to the pursuit of happiness? That phrase, again, we say, you know, every revolution contains in it the seed. Is this the seed, the pursuit of happiness? The very core idea of this document is the thing that leads to its unwinding. Well, it's really been corrupted in the language, right? What happiness meant uh, here and what happiness is, is now a real convenience. Comfort is happiness now. Comfort, contentment, yeah, pleasure. Yeah. yeah, and he says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But I think it's important that that, that self-evident, the idea of evidence, matters a lot. They don't say we hold these truths to be given. We right. don't hold these truths to be delivered unto us by God. The language of the scientific revolution of the Enlightenment is in here. It is self-evident. The evidence gives us the sense of direction. We have the tendency naively to overly romanticize how messy it can be to move from success to significance. We're the ones with the power, we're the ones with the control, we're the ones that control the systems, that organize the systems, that design who has a voice, and when a voice is inconvenient, is there really a way for that voice to break through and for those powers to break through? With power comes responsibility. It's one of the things to always remember. And it's one of the things where rights and duties actually come together mm -hmm. as a function of that. I don't think you can have one with the other, and I think you have to recognize that. And so the key question whenever you find yourself in a position where you can do something is think about, am I doing enough? 
and how do I do more? Within our society, there are issues that are very troubling for us. There, frankly, is a sense that there isn't entirely a consent to be governed in the way in which we're governed, and yet we don't necessarily take action. So when we talk about success to significance, this is a big part of that. I and mean, what is the significance for all of us? What is our declaration? This document outlines the core battle line in the Enlightenment, which is one, as you said, we're still fighting today, which is the liberation of the individual that where you're born and who your parents are, that's not what determines your life, the color of your skin, none of those things do it. When Jefferson was writing, at least these 57 people were willing to take on a set of challenges and dangers and, and whatnot in an uncertain world. That's what we're trying to ask you all to do when we talk about this notion of moving from success to significance. I think we know where the problems are. There's certainly enough of them to find them pretty easily, whether it's real close or real far away. I think the question is how you keep your spirit and your confidence and your energy up as you take on the continuation of what you guys have done. So that's probably intimidating as I send you off to your first seminar. Uh, make sure you can sound as intelligent as that. But this is, as I said, the first of 12 booster shots we've produced. I think you can see they're terrific. They're not giving away anything. We don't want to give away anything. But they're meant, they'll show up in inboxes once a month. And the idea is to uh, remind us that we're here because we're meant to be doing things. We're meant to be asking ourselves questions. Uh, and hopefully these questions will never end. So take the rest of lunch to catch up with one another. We'll begin with our mini seminars at uh, 2 o'clock. That'll be followed by the first series of action forms at 4.30. We'll see you back here tonight for a welcome reception. We'll have live jazz out in the marble garden. garden. And with that, thanks again and welcome to the 2014 Aspen Action Forum.